And um, uh, I think it, it, it helps us segue into uh, uh, talking with today's guest. Um, um, and of the eight words that we've been talking about um, this whole time, uh, design, context, question, empathy, iteration, metaphor, visualization, and synthesis, clearly the one that stands out the most for me in today's guest is the notion of empathy or understanding the, your audience, understanding the people you're designing for, understanding the world from their point of view. And uh, here, to, here to talk with us about that is Professor Mark Meyer. Uh, Professor Meyer is widely published in the field of product, service, and business model innovation and has worked with industry leaders in computing, industrial products, and consumer products around the world. He has also taken a leadership role in developing new methods for teaching entrepreneurship and has helped numerous students start their own ventures. Dr. Meyer is director of the high tech MBA programs and is founder of Demore McKim School of Biz Business's Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group. He was co-founder of VentureCom, which became Ardents and was acquired by Citrix. I noticed that all of these companies always have an X or a Z in their name if they're going to be successful as startups. Uh, a, leader, <laughs> a leader in uh, real-time process control and automation software. He's also been part of the startup teams for Phase 2 Software Corporation and InterVista Software. He has consulted with a number of industries in the area of new product strategy, platform management, with companies that include IBM, Hewlett Packard, McKesson, P&G, Mars Incorporated, and BAE Systems. Please join me in welcoming Mark Meyer. Great. Okay. Sure. Well, good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? Excellent. Good. Good. I came in from Atlanta last night, late last night, and we were dodging tornadoes. I was in this uh, working with a company that makes X-ray machines for um, hospitals and for dental offices, and we were in this conference room and. This tornado swung about a mile away. Some people got hurt, actually, but we ducked out and got away from the windows. And then we got back to work again. And um, it, it's really, it's really, uh, we're lucky we live here and don't have to deal with that sort of stuff on a regular sort of basis. It's rare. But anyhow, I, I was asked by, by George to talk to you about innovation and then get into designing innovation. So I'm just starting off with this little example. Who here owns an iPhone? Anybody? Yeah, right, anybody. So you think that it's, it's a, it's a cool-looking product and things like that, but there's a lot of different types. Of, it's a great example to consider different types of innovation, that when companies hit it on all cylinders, they can do really well. So what are the different types of innovation that you have in this product? Yeah. The antenna, that's a piece of hardware, a hardware component, very powerful antenna. What else is going on in terms of hardware innovation inside this product? The screen, so that touch screen has a very nice sort of beveled glass. It's very unique to, to Apple. It has to be extremely durable and extremely good for the tactile touch. It's a marvelous piece of engineering. What else is uh, you, uh, kind of special about the innovation of this product uh, from a hardware perspective? The glass back. That's correct. What about how the whole thing, the form factor, is that kind of unique? Yeah, that's unique. So the overall design is unique. So there's a lot of stuff that's special about the hardware components of this of this product. Now, if we just step aside from the product itself, what other types of innovation are going on here? Let's step up the stack a little bit. What else is special? Well, the software platform that it uses. And what's special about that? That's rather brilliant, isn't it? So the, uh, uh, the Apple OS is what we would call a platform that can be shared across multiple products or devices. And then it enables a bunch of different things that are good, such as when you have a platform innovation such as this, what does it enable then? From Apple's perspective, what does it enable? Yeah. Yeah. What else does it enable? Yeah. 
carry your world with you. So it, what else is an enable? Well, it kind of restricts buyers into buying Apple products so that you know, if, if you want to have this feature, you have to buy it. That's a business model implication of that. So for Apple itself, it can develop software inside, different capabilities such as user interface that it can then deploy across all its different products itself. Uh, it also uh, enabled or powered a tremendous innovation called iTunes. So iTunes is a piece of software, but really what is iTunes? It's a platform, but and then it is a, it's an e-commerce type of platform. And, and they made a very big decision there to, to, uh, to actually port it on top of Windows. Why is that important? They hate, they don't hate Windows. The only people that hate Microsoft are probably IBM, but just step aside from that. Well, it allows them an, an entirely new way of making money from a much broader audience, correct. So it leaves the Apple proprietary world and goes into the Windows world and, and so forth. And then what happens inside of once you have iTunes? What's happening? What sort of innovation then happens on top of the iOS slash iTunes environment? What's going on there? What sorts of innovations are happening? Yeah, you know, what do you want to play? What else? Apps. So when we get into the world of apps, correct. Then what, who's, who's building apps? Hopefully all of you folks, you know, make some money, build some apps. And you have to certify through Apple so it's tightly controlled. But basically Apple gets all of you in the world to develop and spend their time and money to develop point-specific apps or solutions that then it can only be resold through Apple, and Apple takes a piece. So actually, the sales of the apps themselves have far exceeded the sales of traditional iTunes music products and content. It's amazing. It's just like a money machine. It's brilliant. So you, you have this whole business model innovation. So you have hardware innovation, which is really nice. And it, there's a lot of nice design in here. You have software innovation, which has great platform or technology innovation that's spreading across. But there's also a lot of design. And I, I think Macs are just so easy to use compared to Windows garbage, even though I still have a ThinkPad myself. But that goes back some history. So there's design innovation in the software. And then the business model innovation, which is really the, based on this thing called iTunes, is probably the most profound type of innovation that, that one can think of. So there's lots of different types of innovation going on here. There's also people talk about branding innovation, which is great branding design. And, and if Apple is nothing else, if not a tremendous branding innovator, there's a lot of stuff going on in this simple little product. It's a mar and we use it every day. And we, if, you, if you start looking under the hood, it's, it's innovation just in multiple, multiple dimensions. It's a very, very cool product. And if you were to start learning about business and like making a lot of money and blah, 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 you can see that right off of Apple's own financial statements that their traditional businesses, like the old desktop business, like everybody else, is actually in decline. And that their portables or the MacBooks or the Mac Airs are increasing. That's uh, six billion. That's 17 billion, not million, billion in sales last year. Uh, EMC, the big storage company who gives all these com all these buildings to Northeastern, uh, um, the founders, you know, the engineering research building and in the gym is another founder. That whole company is doing about 17 billion in revenue, and that's just the MacBook business essentially of, of Apple Computer. It's very, very. It's actually very cool, isn't it? It's very cool. But then that's not where the music is because Apple's almost $160 billion in revenue. The real music or the real action is really coming in the sale of the iPhone. That's where all the growth has been. 87% growth in the prior year, 71% in the current year, 2012. And you know that when you buy an iPhone like at an AT&T store, you're only paying $200 if you sign up for two years. But AT&T is paying Apple basically $600 for each single one. That's who their customer is. 
for that product. And you can just go through this. This is off of a standard public reporting system called a uh, 10K annual report. So there's the iPod sales, which is kind of old, so it's going down, just like the old PC is going down. But it's been replaced and supplanted with portables in here with uh, the iPad and the iPhone and, and then all the stuff that's happening on top of this. One little uh, uh, sort of like overlooked um, aspect to their business is their service revenue, which is only three and a half business, but billion dollars. But I'll tell you something, those Apple Care contracts, these machines don't really break. You pay a lot of money when you buy a product and you never you really use Apple Care, but rarely. It in itself is a money machine. I'm not going to spend a lot more time on Apple, but it, it is uh, it, it's it's a great case where they have hardware, software, and business model innovation that directly translates into line items on the revenue. I'm not really looking at the profitability here, but the revenue statement and the growth of that revenue in a really successful company. The Apple stores itself are just an amazing phenomenon. They're just, they're just hot. They're beautifully designed. The people who work at them are really well trained. Everything is well considered. You know, customer service for in, the PC, in, the, in the computer business has always been seen as a drag. You know, your computer breaks. You're trying to get it fixed. It's the last thing the companies pay attention to. And so Apple says, well, let's take something that's a dog and make it really through design, literally through design, something that's really hot. So they create a genius bar. Who would have thought? A genius bar. The customer service function inside of Apple retail stores called the genius bar. It's just, it's an amazing company. That is innovation and that's design. So anyhow, what I'd like to do is I'd like to teach you a little bit or share with you some methods that, that I use and a lot of companies use to then go into the, innovat the innovative aspect of design. And George asked me to talk about understanding users. So I'm going to show you some examples of how to understand and work with users, and I'll tell you some stories, okay? That's what I'm going to do. So I'll step aside from Apple, who I've never worked with. I'm just a user. And we'll get to some companies that I've worked, that I've worked with. And I'm going to kind of keep this low-tech, because I, I think low-tech or consumer products are more fun to talk about as opposed to just software and computer stuff. Just enter the world of consumer products for a second, and then we can step, step back up perhaps into high-tech. So it all starts with the customer, and the most important thing here is <clears throat> that not all customers are the same for any given company. Who here owns a dog? Anyone own a dog? Okay. <clears throat> so I spent years working with a really, really big pet food company, basically the biggest one in the world. Nobody knows the business behind them. It's a proudly held company. It's part of the Mars family. The same company that makes M&Ms <coughs> is the largest manufacturer of pet food. I think they try it out first all on pets and they bring it over to humans or vice, I don't know. <laughs> but if you just take like owning a dog, who is the user? The dog. Yes, who's the buyer? The owner, who's the customer for Mars? No, it's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's, it, it is kind of, but the customer really for them is, they, they, they would call the customer Walmart, <coughs> a grocery store. They have brands for each one in PetSmart, Petco at premium, uh, uh, yeah, at the premium level. So they have specific brands that go up that stack of good, better, best. And then they would call uh, you and I consumers, and then they would, they would call, like, a dog the user. And each one is not the same. I mean, we can start at, at the beginning of the chain. Walmart is completely different than a grocery chain, of which there's 12 major ones in the United States. But they're a global business. And, and they're completely different than PetSmart and Petco. How are these three types of customers different? Price, quantity, premiumization. So you have to actually make different brands and different packaging for each one. I can't sell, I mean, basically Old Roy is the brand that's sold inside of Walmart. It's their pet food. I could never take Old Roy and sell inside of PetSmart, which is the premium retailer. Instead, they have something called Neutro. They have something called Royal Canin. From, they have different stuff. They have funky stuff. It's really expensive. 
you know, and, and, and then in grocery, which is sort of like one step above Old Roy, they have pedigree. And different types of people shop at these different customers or retailers and then consumers. So now, who owns a dog again? Okay, let's take, what type of dog do you own? A uh, Border Collie. A Border Collie. What type of dog do you own? Do you own a dog? Yeah, a Beagle. A Beagle, oh, that's nice. You like your little beagle? Yeah. Yeah, you like your little call, your collie? Yeah? And so, what guys here own a dog? Anybody? Yeah, what type of dog you own? Uh, black Lab. Black Lab, oh, nice, yeah. That's really nice. So, look, if, if we were to observe and look, I mean, just if I was to spend a day with you, or with you, uh, and I spend a day with you, we would basically understand that men are so different than women. It's like dogs and cats. Basically, how does a woman relate to her pet, her doggy? Do they, re do they treat it as a dog? Yes. <laughs> you are an exception. Do you view, how, do you, how do you relate to your dog? Do you, is it just as a pet? Are you yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, is it more than a pet? Yeah, uh, let me get, uh, because there lots of examples, but if you look at women, particularly young women who aren't married yet, that little doggy is the child to be. I'm just telling you. <laughs> there's love, there's care, there's attention. And so when you design the packaging as a designer and the ingredients as a food scientist, it's going to be really designed with some care and with some attention, and with some good healthy ingredients and that woman who looks at that dog as a kind of like a surrogate sort of child, the child to be, is going to shell out some serious money for that product. I'm just telling you, that's the way it is. Now, we go to a guy who's also young, not married yet. Basically, he's going to relate to that dog not as a pet either, but as a buddy. And anybody who, what guy's your own dog? You own a black, it's like your buddy, right? Yeah, your buddy. And so, like, you don't want to do a, little, a lot of preparation. You know, you just want to get over it quick and go out and take a walk, have some fun, throw some Frisbee. It's like your buddy. Right? Now, if we were to go down, I just came from, out, uh, from, uh, from Georgia. If we were to just drive out of, out of, you know, we were out in the sticks a little bit, most young guys over there, it's buddy, but it's also guard dog. Kind of like there's a guardian thing. And so there's different ways that owners relate to their pets, and you need to design that into the features and pricing and the quality and the pricing for your products that you sell to each one. If, 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 uh, if I'm selling to a woman who already has a bunch of kids to design a product for her, she's managing the family budget so I can't overcharge because she's buying pet food along with everything else. So she's not going to buy premium. I've designed uh, pet snacks for, uh, for, for Japan. And it's totally different than designing pet products for the U.S. I mean, seriously different. Like, in Japan... The smaller the dog, the more money they pay for the dog. So a little chihuahua costs like three times as much as a black lab, even though it's like this big versus that big. Believe it or not, it's true. And then the way they relate to that, women relate, is not mother to child empathically, but grandmother to child, which means to spoil the heck out of their dog. <laughs> so I can show you things that look like an Oreo cookie that are made out of carob. I know I've designed them with cream filling that look just like an Oreo. I can show you pictures. Look at Three Dog Bakery. It's unbelievable. That, that you know, if you buy a box of Oreos over there from Nabisco, it's still like three bucks or three fifty, whatever, just like here. No difference. And Japanese people like Oreos and all that. But you buy the same cookie for a dog, a little dog in particular, as a snack, 15 bucks, 15,000 euro. Not euro, yen. 15,000. It's unbelievable. So that shows you how people, the difference in grandmothers. You've got to understand all this as a product designer. You've got to really understand what's going on. And then there's not only the design of things, there's also the functional output, like what it does. So you need to understand nutrition. There's form and branding. And then there's function, which is nutrition. Not killing a dog. Nutrition. And also something called stool quality. That's the full use case. 
Forget all the other slides. It's all in pet food. The whole world exists in pet food. It's, it's complicated. Users, buyers, and even more. But what's dual quality? You can imagine. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you ever want to work out, in, well, not that you want to work it, but in, in Nashville, Tennessee, for the biggest pet food manufacturing company in the world, no matter what you're studying, design, you can wear funny glasses, you can do anything you want, you know? Marketing, accounting, whatever. Whatever you do, your first two weeks will be spent in the stool quality lab. It's like a rite of initiation. Give you some, some, some gloves, some little, you know, dishwashing gloves. You're going to pick through stool samples on new pet products, and you're going to look for the consistency of the output. That's the full use case scenario. It's really fun to see. <laughs> and, and, you know, actually, the, I must say that what I've observed, the young women handle it better than the young men. It's really quite interesting. Anyhow, I don't know what that means either. Okay, now, maybe it has to do with the baby thing. Okay, so customer segmentation, all customers are the same in a given market. I'm going to give you another, cons another consumer product example. We'll go to people food, okay? And we won't talk about stool quality. We're just going to stay away from that. So, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, so here's the message. Not all customers are the same in a given market. Find the ones you want to serve and focus, 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 focus. Focus. Learn everything you can by spending time with them, learning about them, and finding what turns them on and what really turns them off. The negative is as important as the positive. If you can do that, then maybe you can do something that's better than, in, that, you know, that's currently in the marketplace. So here's, here's a quick example. Well, this is what I always do. It doesn't matter what it is. Develop a persona, which is basically a little scorecard with a picture of your target user that basically goes into their customer demographics. And, and uh, George, well, we have a PDF, whatever. He'll send this, put it on the Blackboard site, no problem. All these slides. You want to know basically how big the market is and how big a opportunity that type of customer represents. For consumer products, how big are millennial guys, if I'm making a product for millennial guys? How many millions are there in the United States, for example, and how much are they spending on this category? That's important information. You want to know if the, if the size of the prize is significant. You want to know basically what their needs are. Perceived needs are problems that people can easily express in a sentence. Late needs are problems that they just swear about and can't express in a sentence. It's just a frustration that people have, and those are the ones who really go after. And we'll look at some examples of that. For example, my daughter's driving an auto, is 17 years old, and you remember, you ladies, when you started driving. And, and so at that point, you didn't have your own car. You drove your parents' car, right? And, and so you're having a blast. What are your parents thinking? We'll stick to young ladies, and I'll pick on young men. Something other example. So what are your parents thinking when you're out driving when you're 17 years old, 16 or 70? What, what are they thinking about? What's going on in their minds? It's not rocket science. This is easy. What are they thinking? They're thinking about accidents. And then they're thinking a little bit deeper. Uh, what are they thinking is causing accidents? Texting, media. So, and so that's, a, and, and they have no idea how to prevent that. They can't take away your cell phone. You'll disown them. <laughs> so now you're in Honda, you make the most reliable cars in the world, doesn't matter. You can drive the most reliable car right into a ditch or into another car. Hurt people. Happens every day, thousands of times. So how do you stop? What do you do? How do you solve that problem? That's a latent need. Perceived needs is you want the car to get, have a nice, comfortable drive, to have good navigation systems so they don't get lost. All these things have great braking systems, uh, all-wheel drive if it hits something slippery, good fuel economy. Those are all perceived needs. You know how to solve them. Late needs is my daughter's texting. She runs a red light. Kapow. I'm going through this right now. So now you're working with Honda as a designer. You're actually living in this really nice place called Torrance, California, where their design studio is for the United States. It's really a fun place to work. Talk about design. 
It's nice. It's funny, though. I think Honda cars are designed rather boring on the outside. They kind of do that on purpose, I guess. It's stupid. But on the inside, there's a lot of wonderful design elegance. So how do we solve that late need if we're working with Honda? What do we do? What's the solution? You're designed, folks. There's no wrong answer. What would you do? Yeah. Excuse me? That's, that's, yeah, that's a no. No, they, they already have that. Okay. No wrong answer. Sorry about that, but it's not a good answer. Uh, next. You got a solution? <laughs> that brings up a whole nother set of fears. Yeah? Exactly. Doesn't take a rocket scientist. Takes you, though. That's great. You came up with it in one minute. So how can you provision a car so that you know who's driving, me versus my daughter for my car, biometric thing, bang, and then when it starts going over two miles an hour, have a little jammer. They're cheap. That blocks the cell phone signal. Phone doesn't work. Sorry. Well, no, that's the basic how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. All they're doing now in the cars is they're putting in biometrics and provisioning a car to the person who's driving it. You can also use that technology to basically eliminate all theft, auto theft. It's a platform put across all the cars. But, like, when my daughter drives that car and she's going over five miles an hour, or it can all be tuned off of, of my Honda website. <laughs> By a parent, for example. By a parent, and parent will pay more for that. It's a new stream of revenue. You can start playing with this. It's really, it's really a fun thing. It's a, you know, technology is a beautiful thing. If you know how to deploy it, <clears throat> you can solve problems, late needs, and make more money in the process. That's what it's all about. So that's a late need. We also look at what, how people feel, their attitudes, their behaviors, and where they like to buy stuff. Let me give you a quick example. One of the companies I have a lot of fun working with, I'm sort of like getting away from high tech because it's so obtuse. Like I was working with x-rays yesterday. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it was just one day. And even though it's cool technology, and there's a lot of neat stuff one can do with it, but look at this. Now we're talking about a baking. Let's go to baking for product. So one type of user is a young mom with a couple kids. And the details don't really matter here, but she's time starved. She has two jobs. You ask any young woman. She has to work all day long and impress her colleagues that she has her act together. And then when she comes home, the second job starts. Second job is she has to cook dinner for everybody, typically. And it's a high stress because everybody's hungry. Everybody else is going to school or working. And she has to perform a second time that day, and it's stressful. Kids are first, by the way. You guys, anybody, you guys, nobody's married here yet, all right, except for George and I. You married? No. No. I have a 17-year-old also. So you know. So here's the deal. I'm married. What you will learn when you guys all get married is the kids come first. Number two, the dog comes next. <laughs> it's all connected. And these are important insights. Number three, what we've learned is that her girlfriends come next. And who comes last? You, guys. So you should actually know that early on. So you're not upset by it. It's just like that happens. And this. For her, for her second job, she aspires to be a better baker. So anyhow, we, what we did is, uh, what we did is, in my kitchen, I have an old house in Watertown. I have this big company that pays me a lot of money to help them innovate. And, you know, they, they could hire designers with funny glasses and all. It's all just a bunch of junk. What you do is you get a whole, you know, not that many either, five or six representative target customers that you're designing for. You buy some wine or some beer, whatever it is. You go with them into their place of use, or if you want to get them bunched together because the girl sharing thing is very important, you bring them to one kitchen, make it as natural as possible, get out of their way, let them bake whatever they want to bake, and see, and then listen to them talking with each other about what's going on, what, what, what really matters. 
So I invited six women like Michelle over to my kitchen. We had a baking party. I was the only guy in the whole place. Kept my mouth shut. I had another woman who was working with me from the company, who was a chef. And we basically went about and had a baking party. And then we ate each other's products. And we listened and learned. And what we learned from that ethnographic experience in one night has come up with the second hottest baking product in the United States. That's no. We're talking about tens and tens of millions of dollars. Launched nationally without any slotting fees. By the way, where's this being broadcast? I should uh, be careful what I say. Tell me where this is being broadcast. Oh, it's just being recorded. Okay. So slotting fees mean, <laughs> slotting fees mean that when you sell something to a grocery store, they charge you $2 million per SKU. If they're, and, and basically have a bunch of SKUs and whatever, and you have 12 major grocery that's why it costs 20, 25, 30 million dollars to launch a new consumer product nationally. It costs a lot of money. It's the slotting. Oh, that's that's the CEO of this company saying, "Shut up, Mark." <laughs> it isn't. So this product is so hot, and it's simple. I'll just show you what it is. Uh, what we learned: that one fundamental insight is the cake doesn't matter as long as she can make it quick and it comes out moist. <laughs> That's it. What matters is the frosting. And women want to personalize their cakes with the frosting and the decorations. That's the fundamental insight for a women, woman with a young family. Not you guys, but for a woman with a young family who's trying to please and perform on her second job. And there's a difference between weekend baking, which is when most of it's done, and during the week baking. During the week tends to be just eat leftovers from the weekend. And so this is what a typical, then you have to go into the place of, the second place of use is where people buy stuff. Designers always forget that. It's not the kitchen. It's where, and so they're, fit, they're confronted with this, which is like a sea of baking products. Not that you guys know anything about baking or even admit it, but there's basically three companies, Betty Crocker, Pillsbury, and Duncan Hines, and they all have the same colored boxes, basically. They have the same ugly chemicals inside their cake boxes, and, and, and uh, there's no consumer loyalty. Who's ever on sale, the target consumer in this case, the young mom, is probably going to buy that. There's no loyalty to brand. So, so you have to innovate around this thing. This is as bad as, you know, this is terrible. Now, there's a different target consumer also that people who are young innovators, they think, well, she buys at Whole Foods, so let's make an all-natural cake and let's charge like 10 bucks for a box instead of two. And that's, that's fine. You should do that, but that's not, it's a very narrow market. You really can't support it. The only people who make money selling products into Whole Foods are Whole Foods, not the entrepreneurs innovating to sell stuff. They're, they're always small businesses. They don't grow big. And these days, if you do a product and they say, oh, I'm going to do Trader Joe's, for some reason, a nasty, nasty set of people are running Trader Joe's now. Do, who here shops at Trader Joe's? Anybody? They steal every innovation that's brought into them. They just steal products. You sell it to them for six months, say, thank you very much. It's not selling well. Six months later, they have a private label manufacturer selling the same thing under Trader Joe's brand. So entrepreneurs just avoid them now like the plague. They used to be cool, but then they got really big and they ain't so cool anymore. Isn't that awful, the way things work? So you've got to fight with this. So we basically designed this. So and it's stacked on top of the different types of cakes, and then on top is the innovation, which are basically three flavors of frostings or tubs, and then some pixie dust, which you sprinkle in, and then it activates. It looks like it's doing something cool. And out comes, in 30 seconds, perfect, perfect frosting, which you then apply. And, and, and then in the frosting, rather than just the same three dumb flavors, there's as many flavors as you want. And they cost absolutely nothing to make. And like razor blades, sell them for a lot. And so you enable simple variety and cho choice and variety for this target user that makes her look like a star in a different way time and time and time again. You have a different flavor every week, every weekend. And, you, and, and your kids are loving you. The dog eats the leftovers. And who cares what the husband thinks? 
Innovation does not have to be complicated. It has to be insightful. It's a difference. You get that nugget of insight, I'm telling you, you can really make something happen. It's that, and the only way you get that insight, you don't hire a consulting firm. I hate to say it, you don't hire a design firm. In my experience, design firms don't like me, I guess. But You just get out there when you're working for a company, you just go do it. And, it, and, and, you, and you, you watch first, you listen next, and then you participate and engage in, and you, you leave aside your, your own biases in the parking lot. I mean, I have two degrees from MIT. I'm basically a nerd. You leave all that aside, and you let the user co-design and innovate, and then you execute, like an entrepreneur, even if it's a big company, which means you build some prototypes real fast, and as soon as possible, get them back in the hands of your target users, and you see if they smile. Like, when we feed a new pet food to a dog, their tail has to wag. I'm serious. No, no, there's probably a metric in the company called, you know, frequency or rate of, of tail wagging. Right? Same thing for, for women. If they're smiling, saying this is cool, you got it. And it's the same thing with, uh, I've designed systems for war fighters and airplanes, jammers, things like that, you know, military stuff, bad stuff. Same thing. You see a pilot smile, say, that's cool, you got it. doesn't matter what it is. You want to bring that smile. And the way you do that is you solve a latent need. You do something they don't think you can do. And it's simple, and it's well-designed, it's elegant. Man, that's a winner. So now the whole shelf has changed with this stack of solutions with variety, and the whole thing goes into a store. And now that's across the United States. Check it out. Now let's go just to carry this example. Here's a different user. Looks like you girls. Now, not married, professional, smart, that's all of you women, successful, really fit, athletic, works out, stays in shape, attractive, personal image is important, cares a lot about the environment. Go figure. <laughs> Very social. And most young women basically... Bake it as for their, you know, grandmothers and maybe their mothers, but they'd like to get into it. There's very few real scratch bakers for young women. But they, aspirationally, they'd like, to be, they'd like to do it. They'd like to make their own stuff. And so I, I, had, I had another, uh, I, I did not do this at my house. I, I did not do this at my house. I, I went out shopping with a bunch of young women in Target. I just asked a pack of young girls right here from Northeastern if they take their old professor out with them shopping for like snacks and stuff and like would they forget, treat me like I'm their uncle who's going to pay for everything. And, and so I said, I'll, you know, whatever you want to buy for the afternoon, I'm treating just like, just I'm buying it. So first we went to L.A. Burdicks. And it has to do with food and self-indulgence with girlfriends, you know. So first we went out to L.A. Burdicks. You ever been to L.A. Burdicks? It's sort of like a, it's like much better than Starbucks. Really nice coffee and a ton of chocolates. A bunch of women go there, and they're just, they're not, they don't let guys anywhere near. <laughs> and it's all self-enjoyment and sharing and talking and blah. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and then you pop the question. And, and then the next thing, you know, they, they, they went to uh, some other places. And, 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 and then, then we stopped at a cupcake shop. Oh, this is cool. I'm saying this is nuts to myself. But I don't say that out loud. You know, four or five bucks for a cupcake. And I said, well, well, what do you like? He said, well, we really like, you know, a nice, dark, moist cupcake. Now, I tell you, that's Red Devil, which is Duncan Hines' brand. It's the moistest. Yeah, I don't know why they call it Red Devil, but it is the most popular cupcake, you know, in, uh, not cupcake, but, but baked product mix in, in the country. And, and so, and, and we like the, the, the personalization, and, that, and we like the permissibility, like it's, we're not eating a whole cake, but just a little cupcake, and, you know, it's any problem. Well, it's, why does it have, you know, unless you can make that at home, but we know how to do it. So, bingo. So, this has just been, this was just released. This is hot off the press. It doesn't look like much, but it is 
indulgent, decadent. No, it's even better, decadent. <laughs> Red velvet, velvet cupcake kit, which includes the mix. You add one egg to it so you get that feeling <laughs> of scratch baking. One egg comes out perfect every time. And you can't really see this, but that's a pastry bag. It comes with a pastry bag, and you can make a dozen of them for less than like 50 cents a piece, like 30 cents a piece, as opposed to five bucks for each one. And a lot of girls like to have their girlfriends at their house and have tea and coffee, no guys allowed, and have a little indulgent treat. They can whip this up, and it makes a girl feel proud. And, and then we have Chef Joe, this guy, uh, and this is Chef Mike, but it's really Joe's really the baker. Uh, he, we made a whole bunch of movies of him of how like to actually do it right and make this thing look super decadent and indulgent. And he's doing it with other girls around him saying, now this is how I do it, now you try it. And it's just a great, now there's a whole baking club for young women, all part of a social network, it's part of the, and this was 75,000 women, Better Homes and Garden, you guys will never read that. But lots of women do. Just voted this the best new baking product for 2013. And it was released just like a month ago to market. This thing is going to rock. Tens of millions of dollars in revenue. And, and, and the company's kind of cool. Who, who's here studying architecture and design? We thought, you know, well, we're making all these cool products. Let's eat our own cooking. So, and the president of this thing is a really great guy. He said, yeah, let's, let's, let's move our corporate headquarters. This looks like an insurance company. Let's, 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 get, let's get it together. So these guys completely, they moved to a new office space. They gutted it. They have, like, huge kitchens in there. They have consumers coming in. This is in a part of New Jersey, nice part of New Jersey, who come in and work with the chefs to co-design new products. And it was just named the... Uh, Look at that, Inc. Magazine, Editor's Pick, Best Place to Work 2013. This company is rolling. And, and the funny thing is, this whole business was started as a hospice for dead, dying consumer brands. And they got a hot CEO. He brought in a really interesting innovation team that's all about innovation and ethnography and design. And they... They, they went out and started buying the worst brands in the world, Duncan Hines, Bird's Eye Vegetables. It's like a $3 billion company. How do you like to work with a product that has a picture of an African-American slave or something on the front, and Jemima Syrup, try and fix that? I told him it's just throw it away. It's, you can't save that. But he, he's focused on doing that. They have... Um, that's Aunt Jemima syrup. What a dumb product. <laughs> it's, it's, it's poison in a bottle. It's sugar. You know, why women feed that to their kids? They ought to, it's just insanity. Uh, they own something that looks like dog food but it's fed to people. It's called Amor, which is like spam or meat in a can. So our strategy for that one is going to be top secret. Turn off the camera. Is you just add an accent de grave over the last thing called a more and make it pate and put in a little <laughs> tin. <laughs> it's going to work. <laughs> no, the really, it's going to work. It's going to work. Anyhow, so that, that's for So then you have to implement this into a modular focused way. A and uh, does all this make sense? You, uh, you, you go hang out in the place of use in the place of purchase, and then you earn some trust, and then you engage, and you're looking just not for the stuff that everybody else is doing in the market, but for that hard stuff, those latent needs and frustrations, and you're trying to solve those and bring a smile to the user's face. That's it. It sound, it's not that complicated. You just got to do it a bunch. Get into it. Here's another example. We went, we had a bunch of young guys like you uh, who, who, who I assembled, a bunch of my students in this idea incubator thing on campus. If you haven't been there, you should go there. There's so much innovation, creativity going on in idea. And it's all run by students. Adults are not allowed. You know, professors, they, you know. They won't even tell me the combination to the place that I, I fund it all. 
not allowed. It's run by students for students. It's a tremendous organization. And I asked a bunch of them if they would help me innovate. So they said, well, you don't mean you want to hang out with us. They know the drugs. Yeah, I want to hang out with you. Well, are you going to pay for everything? I said, yeah, I'll pay for it. Okay, you can come along. <laughs> and, so I, and so I said, well, I, I want to do like a social occasion. Do you guys ever bond and talk? Oh, all the time. We cook with each other. Always a team of like three or four guys hanging out, went to the apartment, went to the grocery store, and they're like on a mission before a game to buy a bunch of stuff to eat while the football game is going on. And so they're texting each other on cell phones, you get this, you go that. Then they come back and they throw it all together. Half of it comes out like dog food, the other half is edible. And I don't say a word. And then they start pounding down the beers and watching the game. So we came up with a concept called the game day. I think it's brilliant. It's, it's not executed yet, so don't tell anybody. Game day, which is like an open coffin freezer with all the different little, you know, chilies and some, some raviolis because we found out young men like diversity. They don't want to eat just the same thing, so different chilies, some different Chinese raviolis, different stuff that's easy to cook that, that, that this guy just went ahead and prototyping. We're testing out right now. It hasn't been launched. But it is going to be right at the front of the store. So... Guys going out before game day for that special weekend occasion, get everything in one spot, convenient, get it all done, microwave most of it, good to go, comes out perfect. So that's how these things work. So now let's talk about then how you implement. This gets a little bit more technical. You don't just only throw everything, all these ideas, at a product en masse because it never works. It comes out like a mess. Honda says that i got to take away that fear of the parent who's buying a car for a first-time driver, letting her use it. I implement that in a specific subsystem with inside the vehicle. Or if I want to put in a new type of hybrid engine, I put that in the powertrain. In other words, you innovate specifically. So, so what, what folks do is they say, I have this compelling user frustration. I then have some features I like to put in. And then I get very specific about where I focus that. I say layers, but these should just be parts of a product or service. So you innovate to something specific. Let me give you an example. And here's a layer diagram. Forget about all that stuff. Here's an example. We'll go into something. We'll go into like a guy's product, okay? Because we're doing women's product. Here's a guy's product. This is a real guy's product. This is basically a drilling system to go for oil and gas and water. This is a cool system. It's a company in Pennsylvania that's been doubling in revenue every year. It's just a great company. And they're buddies of mine, good friends of mine. And so uh, I went out with the president. He, want, he wanted to do a job to grow. He wanted to double the revenue of the company over the next two or three years. That's, that was the goal because they had bought this from the original owner. They took a lot of debt. The only way to pay off the debt was to increase revenue. And so... We, we, and they were just doing um, water drilling rigs. And we made the strategic decision to also do natural gas. We need different types of drilling bits and different attachments. And what's in Pennsylvania where this company is located? A ton of natural gas in the shale rock. So it was a good local type. And so we made a decision to expand the, the target from just drilling deep water wells into going after natural gas. And so what do you think? We went to the library? What do you think we, how, how do you think we came up with the design drivers for the next generation of all this? One design driver, we wanted drill bits that were flexible to so do both water and natural gas and now oil. And, and they're not really, really deep, but they go down like 5,000 feet, which is pretty deep, actually. So those were overall strategic design drivers. But what do we do next? What would you do if you were me? What do you do? How would you find out how to make a better solution? Yeah. Go to the operators. Go to the operators. Well, well, now think about the full use case. So you're an operator, and you're going to drill a hole for natural gas, okay? What are you going to do? What's the first step? <coughs> you've, let's say you've talked with a person who owns the land and the utility, you got it all done. The business end is done. Now you go do the work. Give me the use case. Just imagine what it is. You got to drive, drive there. So 
uh, I jump in with the president of the company. He's about 45 or so. Nice, nice, nice man. Can't even add. And we start driving. And I say, Ed, you are a really good driver, and you're not what I want. Move over. Let me drive. And at that time, these were big trucks with hydraulics on them to power all the equipment. But all the drilling platform was mounted in a separate attachment hanging off the back of the car, uh, of the truck. So you have a truck that's like 30, 40 feet. You have the drilling to another 30, 40 feet. And where do you drill for water and natural gas? You drill around a straight highway? No, it's up in the hills and valleys and blah, blah, blah. So I'm driving around, and I go around the corner. I just take out. I take out like three mailboxes. <laughs> and he said, good job, Mark. He said, I'll keep a running toll. So the time we got to this site, uh, I had taken out like a dozen. And he said, that was pretty, that's pretty good, Mark. That's pretty good. You might have set a new record. I said, has anybody hit a telephone pole? He said, oh, that happens a lot. So they take out telephone poles because all this stuff is swinging in the little country roads where this stuff happens. And so that was a problem. Then we went to the drill site to deliver the truck. And the people drilling the wells are there. And I look around, keep my mouth shut, and I see them trying to set this thing up. They said, you'll have to come back tomorrow to see what's all assembled because they have to put together a platform, set up the drilling station, connect the hydraulics. Everything has to be kind of level. There's a lot of site prep. So I said, 24 hours? Yeah, come back. If that, that's if it goes right. And then we would start drilling. So, so I came back the next day, and I didn't drive a truck. He wouldn't let me. I just drove a car with him. And then we went there. And there were three guys off in the rig, and two of them were missing fingers. I said, Ed, what the hell is going on here? He said, well, that's typical. Because you have to attach one, a new section of pipe to another section of pipe. You would change, and you sort of like, just like in the movies, you have to attach it. And that's where guys get their fingers caught when they've been working, you know, on, the, on these high-pressure drilling situations all day and night. And, Big problem, so they lose fingers. If you've been working the business, problem. That's a late need. And, and then I said, well, can, can, can I actually run the drilling platform? Will they let me touch it? He said, no, Mark. It can, it, it's, it will, it will, it's very complicated. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'll show you. So we go to the drilling platform, and there are literally like a dozen levers that control the speed of the drilling, the angle of the drilling, the torque, all this sort of stuff. Very complicated for the actual drilling. And so there we have three clear late needs. Knocking down telephone poles, setting up something, that's four. Losing fingers, three. Complex operations, four. Four late needs. So then we just got together. Since it's drilling, I will say it was done over a bottle of scotch. And we designed on paper, a solution, and then they implemented it. Companies tripled in sales. Unbelievable. They're, I mean, they're just hammering. They imp and implementation is really hard. But getting back to that model, innovation starts from the user, but implementation is not pervasive. It's focused on subsystems. So knocking down, not knocking down mailboxes. Well, what happens if you use the truck itself as the carrying platform for the drilling system itself so it didn't stick out. In other words, it's right on top of the truck, and then with hydraulics it goes like this, and then the truck itself becomes the base, the drilling rig, and it anchors the whole thing. You can set something up in an hour, not 24 hours. And since it's on top of the truck, it's not sticking way out in the back. And therefore, you don't knock things down. And then they designed, and it's called a telemast, a telescoping just like a telescope rig. So it's not sticking way out in front or way out in back. So you, it just extends out with hydraulics once you're ready to rock and roll. And here's an automated pipe fitter. This goes on the back of the truck. Then the pipes are just loaded up. And then hydraulics puts them up. And then a, mach a, a machine actually cranks them together. No more lost fingers. And then here's a new control system with just two joysticks. 
he did let me use this in back of the manufacturer, so a lot of fun. Remember that that movie on the asteroid? What's it called? Armageddon. Armageddon. I was I was I was that dude. I was the guy who blows himself <laughs> up. Really crank it on down. Back off, Mark. Back off, Mark. No, no, no. And I get to do this again. Boom. I almost broke the whole thing. But but uh, so that's how you innovate. Did you do you remember that some? So it's also a more effective device. It's not only form but function. Do you remember in Chile that there were like 60 or 50 miners who got stuck way, way down deep, like 3,000 feet down in a mine? And then they were all rescued? And they were rescued like in like a week and not like a month and a half? Well, the reason why that happened is the company, this same company, had some of these down in Chile for some work down there. They just stopped it and drove, had one drove right to that mine site. And they were set up in their drilling like in an hour. And they got down there really, really quick. Uh, there's also some flexibility in the system for the, the, the diameter of what you're drilling. That was a big issue there because you had to get not gas or water up. You had to get people up. But anyhow, the company's really proud about that. They saved those guys' lives. So that's how you innovate specifically. How are we doing? Here's another example real quick. This is another project. Again, ethnography and innovation design. I, you guys don't look like you shave. Every, well, you do. You look shave, shave. You shave. This is a local company called Gillette. This is the best shave a man can get. It's also the most expensive. It's three bucks a cartridge. President of the division walks up. He says in front of everybody, 7% of our growth is going to happen outside of North America, Canada, Europe. It's going to happen in brick countries. What are brick countries? Brazil, Russia, Eastern Europe, India, and China. And I have bad news for you. An Indian guy coming into market there isn't going to spend three bucks for a cartridge. Ain't happening. Try more like 20 cents. And so we, we that was a problem. So anyhow, we actually went over to India and saw for ourselves ethnography in the, in the villages. We made one mistake in that ethnography. It shows you nobody's perfect. Uh, so we designed a single-bladed system. We uh, observed that Indian males who are coming into market only shave twice a week no matter what you try to sell to them. And they have very, very thick facial hair. So we designed, instead of this subsystem, which is on a fusion, we got rid of all that garbage and put something that looks like a, pla it's a plastic injection mold but looks like a comb. And then it lifts the hair up, and that single blade scrapes it all off. That's the product design. We called it Himalaya. They now call it Gillette Guard. This is the guard. And these cartridges are replaceable. You use them a bunch of times, so you throw them out, put on another one. They cost like 15 cents a piece. This is for Indian males coming into market who don't, don't want to go to the barber shop. They reuse those old double-bladed shavers, and they're full of bacteria. Because they're used on different guys. They get all sorts of skin infections. It's kind of gross. So this is to replace that for personal shaving systems. And, then, and, and so this thing is now, they're selling a gazillion of them. And what's interesting, the same steel is used for this as for this. The same in plastic injection molding machines are used as this as for this. It is just that the molds are different. And there's only one blade and not five. So it is all platformed like crazy in high volume. Then we go to China because that's the next target. We observe Chinese men, they shave every day. I don't know about you Chinese guys, but they shave every day. Even though most Chinese guys have absolutely no facial hair. But they're shaving every day. Go figure. I mean, you observe this. You don't ask them. You just observe it. And then you say, well, why do you shave every day? Well, I have facial hair. No, you don't. Well, how does it make you feel? Well, it makes me feel clean. So you shave to feel clean and refreshed. Yeah. Well, that's cool. We can do that. So single-bladed product for Chinese guys coming into market. Same sort of deal. Not a lot of money. Low-cost system. But instead of all this garbage to lift up a lot of hair to cut it off, we have a supercharged little pad that costs nothing, literally nothing, 
full of astringent. So then you use it, it actually gives you a nice little facial thing. It makes you feel clean. It's a complete, it uses a lot of the same plastic injection molding, same steel, but we're implementing the latent need, the desire, into a specific subsystem. Instead of this, we got something that looks like kind of a spongy thing. That, and they're going to sell like a billion of those things. A billion. So that's innovation. Okay. So I have a half hour left. I just want to show you a few more things. Well, actually, I think that we should take part of this. We should sit down and have a conversation before we round up this. Okay. okay. Uh, so what, uh, I'm just getting ramped up, man. That's good, yeah. though. <laughs> okay. I've been, I've been working for, for, for four days straight. So why don't we just sit down and I'll relax. I'll not okay. be wired. All right. And, and one thing that innovation takes, by the way, is high energy. You really <laughs> got to get into it. You got to live your products. Well, I'm going to ask you some questions, sir. Yep. Um, first of all, this is excellent because this is about um, uh, teasing out what meaningful differences are. Yeah. Um, with, I mean, this whole, I think if we were going to have one big takeaway from this so far, it's this whole idea of latent need. I love that, that you can ask people and you can ask people and you can ask yep. people, but until you glean that thing, they probably won't tell you. That's right. Um, and you can't get it from a survey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, my mind races to many kinds of many of the dissatisfactions we have in life, some of which come from our commercial relationships, yep. um, that, that you could focus on and you would find yourself solving a completely different yes. problem than the explicit yes. uh, purpose. I mean, you know, cars are a great example. Um, we talked at the beginning of the course, we, talk, we, we, did, we did a little bit on how different uh, products are so solve different needs over time. And so yes. So we asked, what is a car? And initially, it was just a carriage without a horse. Right. Uh, and, and it had all of the, all of the sort of class-based baggage of having someone take you around, yeah. but servants to, to, to operate it for you. Yeah. And then it solved a completely different problem. In the, actually, last night, uh, they, uh, PBS did a, a, a great biography of Henry Ford and the Model T. And it's, it's hard to overstate how transformative that was yeah. because it was solving a different problem. It was right. about, about everybody and getting the cost down really low. Right. Uh, then it has be merged into something that's much more about identity. Why do, why, to stick with your gender themes, uh, why do guys buy gigantic Ford F-150 pickup trucks? Are they working on farms? I don't think so. Uh, you know, there's, there's there, there are other purposes. Yeah. And um, I think that it, it, in, in essence, you know, when, when you and I first talked about you're coming here, it was exactly uh, uh, on this subject about how you have to mine information and tease out that which is the, the thing that is actually driving decisions. And um, uh, of course, that's what I think all kinds of designers do. I mean, you know, a lot of the people who have come to visit the class, I think, um, still imagine when Dan Kennedy was here talking about reinventing journalism, yeah. which is just... It's, ex it's exactly like this because it's, uh, you know, um, people have different needs for it in different, at different times in our evolution as a society. Right. And we have different expectations of it. And when the newspaper suddenly, because of technology, had to get completely reinvented, it caused us to now think more uh, uh, explicitly about what those different needs were. And... Uh, I really appreciate this, uh, uh, how you've been breaking uh, some of these things apart. And uh, yeah. by the way, I'm sure all, everybody in this room um, who has shopped at a grocery store is now going to shop at it differently and feel, <laughs> you know, and feel like this is a completely different landscape than yeah. I thought it was. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a lot of action. Yeah. 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 So, so um, there's, you know, when you talk about, we talk about empathy, well, the term we use is empathy, and yep, I think that's or very... empathic design. Yeah, empathic design. I mean, I think that's... Yeah. You know, it seems to me that in the business world, this has actually been something of a sea change a little bit, let's say in the last 20 years. Uh, here's, here, I'll, I'll give you an example. You can tell me if, if I'm barking up the right tree here. IBM, 20 years ago, went through a really big fundamental identity change, I think, from being a company that made... Pro maybe 30 years ago 
that made products based on its expertise versus one that became a, more of a consulting company that solved problems that may right. likely include computing. Right. And it seemed to me like that was a perfect, explicit example of turning the world around from making products because we know how to make them yep. to solutions. solutions. Yeah. Is that a broad theme in, in, it, in business? It, it is. I think, I think the, the broadest thing is for designers is to not be arrogant. Hmm. For you young designers or architects, you and, and, and to not all and to not just focus on something that looks cool, but something that functions really well and performs. And, and striking that right balance, I have a great I have a great example. But uh, how many people are in architecture here? So I, and anybody here live in the West Village? There in the student, only only one or two. Well, the person who designed that is a good friend of mine, Cliff. Cliff Gailey. Cliff Gailey. And I was living in Amsterdam last year. And Cliff and I uh, got on bicycles. And if you've ever been to Amsterdam, they have all this funky architecture that is almost goes overboard, depending on, you know. But it really some interesting statements. And we went to the brand new music building that looks like a million bucks. And it didn't function well. I mean, I have, actually, let me just quickly see. We'll get it. Here it is. I, I put a picture in it. It's in the best location. This is where, that's where I live. Most people live in stuff like this. So this is quite a statement. And it has all these colors. It has all this cool stuff. This is Cliff. I just threw a picture of me over there. But when, when, we, when we talked with people, basically, there's no changing room for the musicians to perform. So they have to ride on their bicycles, nobody drives, wearing their tuxes before they go perform. And the weather just stinks in Amsterdam. So they're coming and looking like a wreck, and there's no place to change. Right. And they have to bring their instruments with them. Or there's no way to custom engineer the acoustics of different music rooms. That's a problem that can be solved. So the architects focused on the outside. They didn't focus on the functionality on the inside. Right. And, Cliff, and Cliff is now designing the new conservatory building for the Berkeley School right on Mass Ave. He was yeah. just taking pictures and taking notes. And I was sort of doing the ethnography or empathic thing with the, with the musicians who had to perform and the people who had to set up music rooms. And they, I just said, you know, boy, this is a great looking building. What's it like to work here? And then it comes out. Well, this is, I, I, will, uh, I will say this is a function, uh, and it happens, it happens from time to time. It depends how the architectural problem is articulated. And the fact of the matter is a lot yeah. of people, uh, especially uh, including those who are not architects, um, romantic, you know, we all have our own um, latent uh, confusions. Yeah. One of them is romanticizing the, um, the heroic solution that the architect will bring. It will be a, th a work of art, and I don't need to intervene much. I don't want to mess with the maestro. I don't want to. And of course, yeah. if the, you know, it's like anything else. If you articulate the problem well, yes. Are, in other words, clearly the problem for this, and of course, I, my even using the term problem is a loaded thing because part of the issue is that they didn't think of it as a problem to solve. They thought of it as an artifact to create. We have this cultural landscape. We want yeah, to make a modern thing, and it is colorful right. and it has modern. Has to stand and, out, and it yeah, and it well. So they viewed it as a, as a symbolic problem. As that's right. And and by the way, it probably succeeds as a. Uh, it's symbolic the most remarkable looking building in this new build, building in the city right now. Yeah. Well, but it's both form and function, I guess, in terms of translating design insight into solutions. But 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 I would I would I would press a little bit and say. Just saying function is not enough because you have to articulate what the functional problem is that you're trying to solve. I mean, for example, there's lots of functional issues associated Absolutely. with a music hall. Acoustics, obviously. Yes. But um, usability for use the yeah, teachers now, and the students. Yeah. What, right, what I would do if we were doing a, an analysis like this together, I'd break every one of those um, questions down. Yeah, and absolutely. I'd say, well, um, there's a visitor experience, right. which is one whole narrative. Right. There's a performer experience, which is right. another narrative. There's a um, maintenance or operational 
um, experience, which exactly. is the people that run keep the thing running. Exactly. Um, and those are all you know. You need to be able to list. You I, you, you do a, a study just like you do an ethnographic study of each one of those groups and break down what is the problem with this as far as you Exactly understand. correct. And what are the specific use cases mm -hmm. for each yeah. one of those types of users yeah. and how do they change over the course of the day? Yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. That's exactly correct. Right. Right. You got it, it it is um, you know I I'm involved with a lot of public review in uh, for projects in the city. Yeah. And it, this could not be more timely. I mean I'm I'm, a, I'm on a appointed panel that's make helping make a decision about the disposition of a key parcel on the Greenway. Yes. You know, this is a city that has invested, you know, billions of tens of billions of dollars in making what once was a highway a park. So yeah. it's kind of like they don't want to really dramatically screw it up at this point. Yeah. So there's a small parcel, but it, it, if I if I just said, well, I just think it should function well. Well, that's sorry, that's not anywhere near specific enough. Right. I need we do. Okay, for whom? For who? Yeah, yeah. The, who, there, there are yeah. all these different constituencies. There's yeah. tourists. Yes. There are office workers. Right. There's people that live in the North End. Right. There's people that work at Government Center. Right. There, you know, and before you know it, you've got eight different groups. And if you make a list of their, how they, how they live and how they use this, it's completely different. Well, we all come from the centralized parking facility because we're coming from out in the sticks. Yeah. We come through mass transit. And, and, there's, and there's law enforcement. Uh, I'm doing a project now with Philips, which is a lighting, big lighting company, like the biggest. And so they are leaders in, you probably know them, what we have in the visitor center, the color LED lighting systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and lighting in general, outdoor lighting, it's a lot cheaper to actually operate. There's a lot of cost savings in this form of lighting. But they're also now getting to the business of putting up, designing and putting up different types of lighting poles, like within inside of cities. And they're viewing those poles as platforms for different types of sensors. Mm -hmm. So like right now, it's not a Philips project, but it's an IBM project. Uh, they have sensors where if a gunshot goes off. Uh, they can triangulate the position. They triangulate exactly where it's, they can tell whether it's a muffler or a gunshot or whatever it is. Right. And then that uh, sends off a series of workflows to direct uh, law enforcement officials to remediate the problem, get on, get on it quick. Right, right. So, so in the in in your Greenway example, yeah, it, you got to also say time of day, like mm -hmm. what happens at night. Right, right, right. right and right. and I'm sure that you're consider you have to consider all those things in terms of your use cases. Well, what's interesting is when it comes to in a way, designing systems and things like this. This is yeah. what IBM is is into the Smarter Cities project. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to designing systems, that's when you really have to be clear about what problem it is that you're trying to solve. Like, yes. there I was thinking I was a lighting company. Yes. And a actually, I'm a signals company, or yeah. I'm part of something that is right. uh, helping. I'm an environmental monitoring. Yes. It's right. a completely different business model as well. Right. That's, that's, yes. see, I think that's really interesting and something that would be of great interest to students is to think of, because, you know, we still train architects. I mean, even though the world has changed dramatically, and we do, we have changed dramatically with it, the, the, uh, it's hard to always anticipate um, all of the new things that people are going to be doing after they get out of school, right. just as in business. Right. I mean, uh, I assume there's, you know, you, 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 there's less of the green eye shade and ledgers, and there's more of other kinds of tools. This has become a lot about innovation these days, mm -hmm. and then linking that innovation into new ways of basically growing revenue and making money. Mm -hmm. and, and, and definitely now these days is serving new types of users. There's not a consumer products company in the world, for example, that isn't totally confused about how to make products for you folks, millennials, because they focus for eons on people who are your parents, me. Right, right. And you're not like me. You buy for different reasons. And uh, so, yeah. You know, I've, I, I have a question for you on that very score, on this sort of, you know, the challenges. You know, we're, we, we, deal, we think all the time about the challenges facing design schools yeah. and are broadening our offerings and changing some of our offerings for these very reasons. But right. One of the things that, that I think is, uh, is a real uh, innovation challenge is how to better map 
real costs, societal costs, in a market-driven economy. As our, as our society has become ever more market-driven right. and more efficient, yeah. um, some of the things, you know, it used to be that there were some social benefits that accrued to us actually through the inefficiency of some operations. Yeah. And, and, but now as, as things get more and more efficient, we get better and better at providing you with your specific personal needs in an incredibly uh, 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 efficient manner. I, you know, how we can, and this is really germane to this topic on the Greenway, actually. How do we, we, we can map what the potential lease revenue generated by development A versus development B on this parcel. That is a really clear right. Excel spreadsheet thing. But then, as we just started to talk about, there's like 90 other things that have to do with public and private interests of various types. Yeah. But it's really hard to find a, a, a platform to map public and private interests with. Yeah. And that seems to me to be a challenge for our business school and, and for this, it, it, for innovators. Because, yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, that is so clearly, especially as more and more of the world becomes more and more enamored of our yeah. market-driven system, um, because it provides many, many things very, very well. Yeah. But there are some things that it, it has become cle becoming clearer and clearer that it doesn't provide so well. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a very complex uh, issue or question. In, in a whole class of innovations, you're basically designing things to make people healthier or to prevent them from getting hurt or to keep them alive. Like I started a company that got, did very well, got bought actually, then just a great company, where all the company did is it prevents doctors inside of hospitals ordering drugs for me based on somebody else's lab results. It happens 100,000 times a year in the United States. So there there's a clear society, the whole thing is a societal benefit. And, and the software company makes money by licensing it out its solution. That's a clear. In other companies such as, uh, such as uh, these, these, these coffee companies with a single use thing, brings great pleasure to the user, but they pollute the environment, right? They're really bad for the environment. They're not recyclable. So we had a student right here in Northeastern, works for Cura Coffee Company, and she made a recyclable K-cup. Or an espresso, which is an amazing consumer brand. Mm -hmm. Now you bring back your things and they say they recycle them. Who knows what the hell they do. And, but you have to bring them to the right. store. Right. So most companies now, in addition to design for function and design for form, also clearly think about design for sustainability, which, which tends to be recycling of materials. Right, right. So it works in two different ways. But then there's things like, 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 like societal impact. I, I, uh, I am personally a believer in government intervention, even in private marketplaces where it makes sense, even though I'm a raging capitalist and entrepreneur. So for example, I think there should be a carbon tax. So companies that pollute the environment should pay a tax and, hell, we should just pour it right back into getting rid of the deficit so you folks aren't broke when you're my age, <laughs> which you will be if we don't take care of it. So for me, a carbon tax is a great example <coughs> right. of how to solve a lot of problems, make companies more aware of how they pollute and solve our deficit. You know, it's a good idea. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a very, you have to be specific, George, yeah. in terms of the problems you're trying to address. Right. But do, do, are, are most corporations really good corporate citizens or public citizens? Most are. The CEOs of all these companies that I know and work with, they're thinking about society. They're thinking about programs for training and learning about not polluting sure. sustainability plays, except for a few. Like, don't ever go work for Monsanto. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bad company. Right. I'm glad they're doing poorly in the marketplace now, you know? Adam, are the mics picking this up correctly? I want to just want to make sure. Yeah, okay, so. If you're a farmer, just <laughs> buy all your seeds from Pioneer Hybrid, you know? But let's just take that example. It's, it's complicated because now people genetically engineer corn seed and soy seeds and everything else. Now, people are, are saying, well, these greedy companies are bioengineering these seeds so that they can, you know, uh, sell them more and sell them for more money and 
farmers will be more productive and things like that. Well, there's something called climate change going on. Thank God for those seeds. And the population is increasing. So that, like, if, if you don't have seeds that can grow effectively in drought conditions, like what's now killing the Midwest, you are not going to have a crop. And then you won't have the food to feed the world. And so technology, you have to look at it carefully and, figure, and consider the longer-term environmental benefit. Anyhow, so, so George, I think it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. I have a brother-in-law who is the Greenpeace leader for, South, for Africa for stopping the cutting down of the, jungle for, the jungles and planting stupid palm oil plantations, which corrupt governments will just sell off hundreds of thousands of acres to greedy companies to basically produce palm oil which will all be exported in a lot of these countries and does no good whatsoever for anybody but the dictators or the junta running the country. So there are bad companies out there, no doubt about it, but the vast majority of companies that I've worked with are really thinking about society as well as their own bottom line. Yeah, but, but the, um, I mean, I, this, is, this is all uh, relevant stuff, yeah. but, but the idea about, I guess what's different about, let's say, the example of the carbon tax, just yeah. since you brought it up, is that there is, and, and this is where I see the opportunity actually for the real innovation, is not on are the CEOs of, or of various companies good yeah. people or bad people, it is that how can we, um, how can we create a, a better way of modeling or mapping real costs? Because it's very easy to uh, map profit and loss I mean, that's yeah. very straightforward. You don't yeah. need to be a good person or a bad person. Right. You are either a profitable person right. or you are somebody who's losing money. Right. And I guess what a, a place for, a place that, something that, as the world gets more complex, um, something that, it seems to me, is an opportunity in business school, uh, this is unsolicited uh, suggestion for, for business schools, is to help us, because you guys are so good at, um, at, at, at mapping costs and expenses and tracking uh, and modeling, that if we can find a way to improve the quality of our markets so it doesn't require an extraordinarily excellent person <laughs> at the helm to, to make good outcomes, but rather that we have a system that is directed towards uh, good outcomes. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's a, that's a, it yeah. seems to me a real challenge, and it's, yeah. uh, um, it's, it's one that we certainly we have in the world of the built environment because we are not able yet to model all the real consequences of, yeah. of, of anything, of a, a, yeah. a, a new development. Yeah. It's going to make more traffic, yes, but on the other hand, people will drive less, maybe yeah. a little closer to work. That's no, a good challenge. Yeah. I'm, I'm really focused on putting a smile on different types of users' faces <laughs> with innovation. But it is, it, there is a longer tail to innovation, and it is true that is something that could be considered. Now, as a businessman, I would say, and what other additional economic ar opportunities are there in that longer tail? Right, right. Because businesses are in business to make money. Right. Uh, and they have investors and shareholders, and that's their purpose. Right. And it keeps things nice and crystal clear. But maybe the answer to this is to extend the innovation lens to something that's much longer tail and considers the uh, uh, societal and environmental consequences to stuff that's launched to market this year to produce some new streams of revenue. This is a good thought. I'll have to think about that. That's a new dimension to innovation. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me hand it I, over. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. We, uh, <clears throat> we just had $60 million given to the College of Business by two alums. One is by a venture capitalist who his long-term thinking is to invest in companies in five or six years, sell them off, and make a ton of money. That's his, that's his time horizon, which is pretty long. And then we have another fellow who started a company called Clean Harbors, which basically is in the business of cleaning up oil spills. And then he got into the bit, and he's a tough, great guy, Al McKim. And then he got in the business of helping pharmaceutical companies and others who, put, who create industrial waste, basically manage that by picking it up and hauling it off and burning it off in incinerators. That's what he did. That's what he does. And then more recently, with the, uh, with the growth in fracking, his new major growth area is to basically take all this polluted water and remediate it and not make it absolutely drinkable, but not make it get rid of all the bad chemicals in it. And so there are entrepreneurs who see these environmental and societal problems 
and they are coming up with very point-specific solutions and creating new businesses from that. It's a great thing to do. It's a great thing to do. Any questions from the, from the crowd here, from the audience? Any questions? So what colleges are you represented by? You've got architects. Who here is from music industry? Anybody from music industry? Anybody from business school in this class? There you go. There's some business people. Anybody want to start a company? <laughs> well, certainly. Come see me whenever you do. <laughs> How about engineering? Any engineering? Lots Look of engineering people. These guys are all, they're on the cutting edge of fracking, all of them. <laughs> I was, a, I was uh, getting my uh, Ph.D., in, uh, in uh, computer engineering and dual business at MIT. And I, I, had, I was in a class like this, and I had the worst professor in the world over there. And well, they're every, trying to overcome that, too. And, and everybody was going nuts, so I, 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 I kind of dropped out of school for six or seven years in the middle of my PhD to start my first software company. And, and, and so we actually took, so you could do that back time, took some software out of the labs which was real-time operating system work, really nerdy stuff for those of you that in engineering. And our first application for using this technology was for brewing beer. <laughs> and, and we became the market leader in process control systems for brewing beer in the entire world. We had a partner called the Foxborough Company that put in these systems worldwide. And so what we did is we had this old guy, my age at the time, on our board, and he said, make them ship you a keg of beer once a month. So in return, they'll get 24 by 7 customer support when the software breaks. I said, we can't do that. He said, yes, you can. I'll do it. So once a month, eight kegs of beer came from eight major <laughs> brewers to our company offices in Kendall Square. And that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Okay, we, I, think we've see, I think we've heard the, the, the fruits of innovation. There you go. That's right. A lot of benefits. So anyhow, anybody have any questions? I'm, I'm at the business school and uh, hanging around all the time, so stop by if you have an innovation idea and you want to see how to make something with it, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. All right.